We do hope that you enjoy hearing this special audiobook presentation and that it will help to light your pathway in life. Please feel free to share this audiobook with friends and loved ones. This is for educational purposes only. Ancient Secrets of the Flower of Life by Drunvela Melchizedek. Chapter 2 The Secret of the Flower Unfolds The Three Assyrian Temples in Abydos. This temple is in Abydos. It was built by Seti I and dedicated to Osiris. Behind it is another very old temple called the One Assyrian Temple, where the wall carving of the Flower of Life was found by Katrina Raphael. There is still a third temple, also dedicated to Osiris and also called the Assyrian Temple. Evidently, when they were digging back into the mountain to build the city one temple, with full knowledge that the third Assyrian temple was there, they found the older, second Assyrian temple between the two. City one changed the plan for the newer temple into an L shape to avoid destroying the more ancient temple. It's the only L shaped temple in all of Egypt, which strengthens this idea. Some people say that City one built the older temple, too. However, the older one is a completely different construction design and has much larger stone blocks. Most Egyptian archaeologists agree that it is a much older temple. It is also lower in elevation than the city temple, which gives credence to its age. When City One began construction of his new temple, the second one looked like a hill. The third temple, the long, rectangular one in the back, is also dedicated to Osiris and it is one of the oldest temples in Egypt. City One was building his temple on this site because the other, third, temple was very old and he wanted to dedicate a new temple to Osiris. We look at the City One temple, then the third one, then the second and oldest one. Carved Bands of Time In recent times archaeologists have discovered something very interesting about the wall carvings in Egyptian temples. Tourists usually notice that there appears to be a great deal of vandalism on the walls, where a lot of the hieroglyphs, especially ones of the immortals, had been chipped off and destroyed. What they might not notice is that the chipping is in a specific horizontal band, from about eye height up to about 12 to 15 feet. There is no chipping above or below that. I didn't even notice that when I was there, it just didn't click. It didn't click for a lot of Egyptian archaeologists either for hundreds of years, until somebody finally said, hey, the destruction is always in this very specific region. From that realization, they began to understand that there was a difference between the region below the destruction and the one above. They finally figured out that there are time bands on the walls. The band from about eye height down to floor level would represent the past. The band from my height up to about 15 feet or so would represent the present, the time the temple was built, and higher than that, these temples sometimes go up 40 feet and more, would tell about what will occur in the future. The archaeologists then realized that the only people who could have understood this relationship and actually chipped the hieroglyphs was the priesthood of the temple. The priests were the only ones who would have known that they were chipping out only the present. An ordinary vandal would not have been so precise in selecting only the band representing the present. Besides, the destroyers did not come in with a sledgehammer, they actually chipped certain things out very carefully. It has taken all these centuries to figure this out. The City One Temple. This is the front of the City One Temple at Abydos. This is a small portion of a huge, huge temple. I know now of at least two proofs that the Egyptians could see into the future. I have a picture of one of these, way up high on one of the beams in this portion of the first temple that Abydos is something that, if you've never seen it before, is hard to believe, but it's there. I'm going to get a picture of the other one the next time I visit Egypt, because I know exactly where it is. I think these two pictures are absolute proof beyond any doubt at all, that they were able to see the future. How they did it I don't know, that's up to you to figure out. But the fact is, they did. At the very end I'll show the picture that proves this. The third temple. This is the third temple of the three, a long, open temple. This temple was considered the most sacred spot in all of Egypt by the ancient kings and pharaohs 
because they believed that this was where Osiris had experienced resurrection and become immortal. King Zosa, who built the beautiful funerary complex at Saqqara with its famous step pyramid, supposedly for his burial, did not bury himself there. Instead, he buried himself at this little unpretentious back temple. They don't allow anyone into this third temple. But I couldn't stand to just look down into it. There was nobody around that I could see, so I dropped down over the wall into a courtyard. I managed to get about five minutes of space before the Egyptians began yelling at me to get out. I thought they were going to arrest me, but they didn't. The hieroglyphics in there are extraordinary, nothing like you would see anywhere else. The simplicity and perfection of the drawings is remarkable. The second temples. Sacred geometry and flower. Of life. This is the second temple of the. Three, which is lower than. The other two. It was buried under. The earth before they dug it out. The ramp, seen at the right edge. Was built to allow access from the. Higher ground level. I took this picture from the third temple, looking toward the city one temple, whose back wall can be seen in the background. The second temple is where the flower of life drawings in Katrina's photo were found. They allow you to go into only one place in the second temple, which happened to be the perfect place. The second temple is mostly filled with water now because the Nile has risen, but when it was first found, it was open and dry. Here are two inside views of the center of the temple before it filled with water. There are three distinct areas, one, the steps that come in from below to the center of the temple, where there is an altar-like stone, two, the altar-like stone itself, and, three, the steps that go back down on the other side of the altar, which can't be seen here. You will see these three levels represented in the three phases of the Osiris religion. You can see the two sets of steps in the plan of the Assyrian Second Temple on the next page. Lucy Lamy shows here what the original plan of the temple looked like. The two back to back pentagons show the sacred geometry that was hidden in its plan. Now I need to give you some background on this geometry. The shape shown at A is an icosahedron. The surface of an icosahedron is made up of equilateral triangles arranged into five sided pentagonal shapes shown at B, which are called icosahedral caps in sacred geometry. Here the triangles are equilateral. If you were to take the icosahedral caps off the icosahedron and fit them onto each surface of a dodecahedron, twelve pentagons put together as at C, the resulting shape happens to be the stellated dodecahedron D, of the specific proportions of the Christ consciousness grid around the earth. Without this grid there would not be a new consciousness emerging on this planet. You will understand before the end of this work. Two of these icosahedral caps hinged together are like clamshells, indicated a T. These caps are the key, as they demonstrate the geometry used in the Christ consciousness grid. And that's what, I feel, they're depicting in the geometry and plan of this ancient temple. I find it very appropriate that they used back-to-back -back pentagons in the plan for a temple dedicated to Osiris and resurrection. Resurrection and ascension lead into Christ consciousness. Figure 2 to 9 is down in the second. Temple. The arrow indicates the place. Where Katrina unknowingly took a. Photograph of the flower of life. Here's the same picture taken with my. Camera. My photo came out better than hers, and you can see. In the shade that there's another. Flower of life pattern on the same. Stone, side by side. To the left of these. Two flower of life patterns, on the. Same stone, are other related figures. The stones that were used to build. This temple, including the one in these. Figures, are huge. I would say they weigh at least 70 to 100 tons. It makes. You wonder how those hairy barbarians moved all those hundred ton stones around. There are many related patterns on these walls. The left one in this photo is called the seed of life, which comes directly out of the flower of life pattern. There was water at the bottom of this wall, so I couldn't get in there. But I was wondering what was on the other side of the 
stone, so I leaned around. Put the camera on automatic and took a picture to see what would come out. This is what I got. You can barely see it in this photograph, but it shows many of the components that are aspects of what we're going to be studying in this course. It was an amazing feeling to look at these drawings because they were so familiar to me, and I knew what they meant. And here they were, arranged on an Egyptian wall thousands of years old. The drawings were ancient, yet I knew exactly what they were. Carvings of the Copts. This next shot shows a wall in the second temple taken from a long way away using an 80mm lens. On this wall is a drawing, which you can barely see in this photo, though we could see it clearly when we were there. It looks like figure 2 to 15. It's a symbol for Christianity, but it originated with a group of Egyptians called Copts, who lived at the time when the Egyptian Empire was dying. They later became the very first Christians if we include two other Egyptian groups who were connected with them the Essenes and the Druids. You might not think that these two other groups had Egyptian roots, but we believe they did. This is a Coptic symbol, and when I saw it, I realized it was probably the Copts who made these drawings related to the Flower of Life, not the original builders. The Copts came much later, but they probably knew this was a place for resurrection and used it for the same purpose. The building would have been several thousand years old when they made these drawings. In this case the drawings would have been no older than 500 BC. Which is when the Copts began. This is the actual Coptic symbol, a cross and the circle sometimes found inside a triangle. This is another one, in which you see the cross and the circle, though it's very worn. At the top you see the six loops of the center of the flower of life. In Egyptian drawings. Whenever you see a sphere over our head, it means that the focus is whatever is inside the sphere. That's what they're thinking about or what the purpose is at that moment. Figure 2 to 18 is another way this symbol is sometimes used, for intersecting arcs with an outer circle around them. I find this photo very interesting. You see the fish breathing air. This was done before Christ. It's Coptic. It has 13 little notches, or scales if you want to call them that, and it's breathing air. We've seen a fish breathing air before, with the Dogons and in Peru. Now here it is in Egypt, and it is seen in other places around the world as well. The early church changes Christian symbolism. When you go back and really study some of the older writings, you find that there was a big change in the Christian religion about 200 years after Christ died. In fact, he wasn't very well known for about 200 years, at which time the Greek Orthodox Church, which was the most influential church of the day, made many changes in the Christian religion. They discarded many beliefs, added others, and changed things around to fit their needs. One thing they changed was an important symbol. All the way back to the time of Christ, from everything we've been able to read, Christ was not known as the fish, but as the dolphin. It was changed from the dolphin to the fish during the Greek Orthodox editing. Today Jesus is referred to as the fish, and even modem Christians use the fish to represent Christianity. What this means exactly, I don't know. I can only speculate when we talk about dolphins. In addition, the Greek Orthodox Church also removed from the Bible all references to reincarnation, which previously had been fully accepted as part of the Christian religion the flower of life, sacred geometry. This image of the flower of life is not only found in Egypt, but all over the world. I'll show you photographs of it worldwide in volume 2. It's found in Ireland, Turkey, England, Israel, Egypt, China, Tibet, Greece and Japan, it's found everywhere. Almost everywhere around the world it has the same name, which is the flower of life, though elsewhere around the cosmos it has other names. Two of the main names would be translated as the language of silence and the language of light. It's the source of all language. It's the primal language of the universe, pure shape and proportion. It's called a flower, not just because it looks like a flower, but because it represents the cycle of a fruit tree. The fruit tree makes a little flower, which goes through a metamorphosis and turns into a fruit, a cherry or an apple or something. The fruit contains within it the seed, 
which falls to the ground, then grows into another tree. So there's a cycle of tree to flower to fruit to seed and back to a tree again, in these five steps. This is an absolute miracle. But you know, it just goes right over our heads. It's so normal that we simply accept it and don't think much about it. The five simple, miraculous steps in this cycle of life actually parallel the geometries of life, which we'll continue to see all through this work. The seed of life. As I was showing earlier, in the middle of the flower of life are seven interconnected circles which, if you take them out and draw a circle around them, would create the image called the seed of life. The tree of life connection. Another image in this pattern, which you're probably more familiar with, is called the tree of life. Many people have thought that the tree of life originated with the Jews or Hebrews, but it did not. The Kabbalah did not originate the tree of life, and there is proof. The tree of life does not belong to any culture not even the Egyptians, who carved the tree of life on two sets of three pillars in Egypt at both Karnak and Luxor around 5000 years ago. It's outside any race or religion. It is a pattern that is intimately part of nature. If you go to distant planets where there is consciousness, I'm sure you'll find the same image. So if we have a tree then a flower then a seed and if these geometries do in fact parallel the five cycles of a fruit tree that we see on earth then the source of the tree would have to be perfectly contained within the seed. If we take the images of the seed of life and the tree of life and superimpose them, we can see this relationship. See how perfectly they fit? They become like a key, one fitting directly over the other. In addition, if you look at the tree of life that was found on Egyptian pillars, you'll see one more circle above and one below. This means there were originally twelve components, and the twelve component version also fits perfectly over the whole flower of life image. There is a thirteenth circle to the tree that can either be there or not. I'm approaching sacred geometry as though you never heard the words in your life. We're starting from the very bottom, and we'll slowly build on this until we get to the place where it makes sense. First you can see the synchronicity of the way sacred geometry forms move together and fit perfectly into each other. This is a right brain way of understanding the special nature of this geometry. As we study more and more complex patterns, you'll keep seeing the same kind of amazing relationships moving through everything. The odds of some of these geometrical relationships happening at all is probably a zillion to one, yet you will consistently see these mind-boggling relationships unfold. The Vesica Pisces. In sacred geometry there's a pattern that looks like this. It's formed when the centers of two equal radius circles are placed on each other's circumferences. The area where the two circles intersect forms what's called a Vesica Pisces. This configuration is one of the most predominant and important of all relationships in sacred geometry, as you'll begin to see. There are two measurements in the vesica pieces, one that runs through the center across the narrow width, and one that connects one point to the opposite point through the center, that are keys to a great knowledge within this information. What many people don't know is that every line in the tree of life, whether it has 10 or 12 circles, measures out to either the length or the width of a vesica pieces in the flower of life. And they all have golden mean proportions. If you look carefully at the superimposed tree of life, you'll see that every line corresponds exactly to either the length or the width of a vesica pieces. This is the first relationship that became visible as we came out of the great void. The great void is another key that will be discussed soon. Egyptian wheels and dimensional travel. These wheels are some of the oldest symbols known. So far they've been found only on the ceilings of certain very old Egyptian tombs. They're always found in sets of four or eight, and nobody knows what they are. The world's most famous Egyptian archaeologists don't have the vaguest idea what they mean. But to me they're proof that the Egyptians knew that the flower of life was more than just a pretty design and that they knew most, perhaps even more of the information that will be shared here. In order to understand where the wheels are in the flower of life, you have to study the tremendous levels of knowledge contained within it. You would never get there by just looking at designs. It's nothing that you could just happen on, you'd have to know the ancient secret of the flower of life. This photo shows most of a set of eight of these wheels. 
The next picture is very dark and hard to see details. This is a ceiling, and it was pitch black where I took the picture. Walking toward the right along the bottom of the drawing are seven people with animal heads. They are called Neeters, or gods, and each of them has an orangish red oval above its head, which Thoth called the egg of metamorphosis. The Neeters are concentrated on the time when we go through a certain stage of resurrection, which is a rapid biological change into a different life form. They're holding an image of that transition as they're walking along the line, then suddenly the line comes to an end and there's a 90 degree shift upward, and they're walking perpendicular to their first direction. This 90 degrees is a very important part of this work. The 90 degree turn is crucial to understanding how to make resurrection or ascension real. The dimensional levels are separated by 90 degrees, musical notes are separated by 90 degrees, the chakras are separated by 90 degrees, 90 degrees keeps coming up over and over again. In fact, in order for us to enter into the fourth dimension, or any dimension, for that matter, we must make a 90 degree turn. Probably at this point I need to make sure we have a common understanding about what dimensions are like third dimension, fourth dimension, fifth dimension and so forth. What are we talking about? I'm not talking about dimensions in a normal mathematical sense, as in the three axes or so called dimensions of space, the x, y and z axes, front to back, left to right and up and down. Some people call these three axes the third dimension and say that time becomes the fourth dimension. This is not what I'm talking about. Dimensions, the monics and the waveform universe. What I'm seeing as the various dimensional levels has to do more with music and harmonics than anything else. There are probably different connotations of what I'm talking about too, though most people who study this pretty much agree. A piano has eight white keys from C to C, which is the familiar octave, and in between those are the five black keys. The eight white keys and the five black keys produce all the sharps and flats in what's called the chromatic scale, which is 13 notes actually 12 notes, with the 13th beginning the next octave. So from one C to the next is really 13 steps, not just 8. Keeping that in mind, I want to show you the concept of a sine wave. Sine waves correspond to light, and the electromagnetic spectrum, and the vibration of sound. Figure 2 to 29 shows some samples. We're all probably familiar with this. In the entire reality we're in, Every single thing is based on sine waves. There are no exceptions I know of except the void itself and perhaps spirit. Everything in this reality is sine wave, or cosine, if you want to look at it like that. What makes one thing different from another is wavelength and pattern. A wavelength extends from any point on the curve to the point where the entire curve starts over, as a from a to be on the longer wavelength, or from C to D on the shorter wavelengths. If you get into a really long wavelength, they look almost like straight lines. For example, your brain waves are about 10 to the 10th power centimeters, and they're almost like straight lines coming out of your head. Quantum physics or quantum mechanics looks at everything in the reality in one of two ways. They don't know why they can't look at it in both ways at once, though the geometries tell why if you study them very carefully. You can consider any object such as this book, as being made up of tiny particles like atoms, or you can forget that idea and just look at it as a vibration, a waveform, such as electromagnetic fields or even sound, if you like. If you look at it as atoms, the laws can be seen to fit that model, if you look at it as waveforms, the laws can be seen to fit that model. Everything in our world is a waveform, sometimes called pattern, or sine wave signature or could even be seen as sound. All things your bodies, planets, absolutely everything are waveforms. If you choose this particular way of looking at reality and superimpose that view over the reality of the harmonics of music, an aspect of sound, we can begin to talk about different dimensions. Overlength determines dimension. The dimensional levels are nothing but differing base rate wavelengths. The only difference between this dimension and any other is the length of its basic waveform. 
it's just like a television or radio set. When you turn the dial, you pick up a different wavelength. Then you get a different image on your TV screen or a different station on your radio. It's exactly the same for dimensional levels. If you were to change the wavelength of your consciousness, and in so doing change all your body patterns to a wavelength different from this universe, you would literally disappear out of this world and reappear in the one to which you were tuned. This is exactly what the UFOs do when you see them shooting across the sky, if you've ever seen one. They shoot across at unbelievable speeds, then make a 90 degree turn and disappear. The people on board those ships are not being carried through space like we are on airplanes. Spaceship passengers are consciously connected psychically to the vehicle itself, and when they get ready to go into another world, they go into meditation and link all aspects of themselves into oneness. Then they make either a 90 degree shift or two 45 degree shifts all at once in their minds, actually taking the whole ship along with its passengers, into another dimension. This universe and by that I mean all the stars and atoms going infinitely out and infinitely in forever has a base wavelength of about 7.23 centimeters. You can pick any spot in this room and go infinitely in or infinitely out forever within this particular universe. In a spiritual sense this 7.23 centimeter wavelength is Om, the Hindu sound of the universe. Every object in this universe produces a sound according to its construction. Each object makes a unique sound. If you average the sounds of all the objects in this universe, this third dimension, you would get this 7.23 centimeter wavelength, and it would be the true sound of OM for this dimension. This wavelength is also the exact average distance between our eyes, from the center of one pupil to the other, that is. If you take a hundred people and average them, it's also the exact average distance from the tip of our chins to the tip of our noses, the distance across our palms and the distance between our chakras, to give a few more examples. This 7.23 centimeter length is located throughout our bodies in various ways because we are emerged within this particular universe, and it is embedded within us. It was Bell Laboratories that discovered this wavelength not some spiritual person sitting in a cave somewhere. When they first put up the microwave system that went around the United States and pulled the on switch, they found static in their system. You see, Bell Labs just happened to pick for the system sending frequency one slightly longer than 7 centimeters. Why they chose that wavelength, I don't know. They tried to find the static, looked through their equipment, tried everything they could. First they thought it was coming from inside the earth. Eventually they looked into the heavens and found it, and said, oh, no, it's coming from everywhere. In order to get rid of the static, they did something that we as a nation and a planet are still suffering from, they upped the power 50,000 times over what they would normally need, which created a very powerful field, so that the 7.23 centimeter wavelength coming from everywhere would not interfere dimensions and the musical scale. For reasons such as the above, I believe that 7.23 centimeters is the wavelength of our universe, this third dimension. As you go up into dimensional levels, the wavelength gets shorter and shorter, with higher and higher energy. As you go down in dimensional levels, the wavelength gets longer and longer, with lower and lower energy, more and more dense. Just as with a piano, there's a space between the notes, so that when you hit one note, there's a very definite place where the next note is. In this waveform universe we exist in, there is a very definite place where the next dimensional level exists. It's a specific wavelength relative to this one. Most cultures in the cosmos have this basic understanding of the universe, and they know how to move between dimensions. We've forgotten it all. God willing, we will remember? Musicians, music theorists and physicists discovered long ago that there are places between the notes called overtones. Between each step of the chromatic scale there are 12 major overtones. A group in California has discovered over 200 minor overtones between each note. If we show each note in the chromatic scale as a circle, we have 13 circles. 
Each circle represents a white or black key and the shaded circle at the end would be the thirteenth note that begins the next octave. The black circle on this illustration represents the third dimension, our known universe, and the fourth circle, the fourth dimension. The twelve major overtones between any two notes, or dimensions, are a replica of the larger pattern. It's holographic. If you carry it further, between each overtone you'll find another twelve overtones that replicate the whole pattern. It goes down and up literally forever. This is called a geometrical progression, only in harmonics. If you continue to study it, you'll find that each of the unique musical scales that have been discovered produces a different octave of experience, more universes to explore. This is another subject we will come back to. You've probably heard people talk about the 144 dimensions and how the number 144 relates to other spiritual subjects. This is because there are 12 notes in an octave and 12 overtones between each note, and 12 times 12 equals 144 dimensional levels between each octave. To be specific, there are 12 major dimensions and 132 minor dimensions within each octave, though in truth the progression goes on forever. This diagram represents one octave. The 13th note repeats, then there's another octave above that one. There's an octave of universes below this and an octave above, and it stretches on theoretically forever. So as big and as infinite as this universe seems, which is just an illusion anyway, there are still an infinite number of other ways to express the one reality, and each dimension is experientially completely different from any other. That's what much of this teaching is about, reminding us that we here on earth are sitting in the third dimension on a planet that is in the process right now of becoming fourth dimensional and beyond. The third dimensional component of this planet is about to be non-existent for us after a while, we're going to be aware of this dimension for only a short time longer. First we'll go into certain overtones of the fourth dimension. Most people in the higher dimensions who are watching and helping with this process now believe that we're going to keep moving on up through higher dimensions quite rapidly. The wall between octaves. Between each whole note universe and between each subspace or overtone universe, there is nothing, no thing, absolutely zip. Each of these spaces is called a void. The void between each dimension is called the duat by Egyptians or the bardo by Tibetans. Each time you pass from one dimension or overtone into the next, you pass through a void or blackness that's in between. But certain voids are blacker than others, and the blackest of these exist between the octaves. They're more powerful than the voids that exist within an octave. Please understand that we are using words that cannot fully explain this concept. This void that exists between octaves can be called the great void or the wall. It's like a wall you have to pass through to get to a higher octave. God put these voids there in a particular way for certain reasons that will soon become apparent. All of these dimensions are superimposed over each other, and every point in space-time contains them all. The doorway to any of them is anywhere. That makes it convenient, you don't have to go looking for it, you just have to know how to access it. Although there are certain sacred places in the geometries of our reality here on earth where it's easier to become aware of the various dimensions and overtones sacred sites, which are nodal points connected to the earth and the heavens, we'll also talk about them later, there are also specific places in space that are tied to the geometries of space. These places are sometimes referred to by explorers as stargates, openings to other dimensional levels where it's easier to get through. But in truth, you can be anywhere to go anywhere. It really doesn't matter where you are if you truly understand the dimensions and, of course, are capable of divine love. Changing Dimensions Going back to those guys on the temple ceiling, a few pages ago, they're changing dimensions. They're making a 90 degree turn and changing their wavelength. And those wheels, as you're going to see later, are connected to the harmonics of music. And you now know that the harmonics of music are connected to the dimensional levels. Since the people on the ceiling are making this change while thinking about metamorphosis and resurrection, I believe these wheels are actually telling us exactly where they went, into which dimension. 
by the time we finish, you'll understand what I'm talking about. The Star Tetrahedron This Star Tetrahedron with Leonardo's image behind it is going to become one of the most important drawings for this work. What you're looking at is two-dimensional, but think of it in three dimensions. A Star Tetrahedron, just as shown here, happens to exist around each human body. We're going to spend a great deal of time to get you to the point where you can see that you do have this image around your body. Notice especially that there's a tube running down the center of the body through which we can breathe life force energy, and the two apexes at the top and bottom of this tube connect the third dimension to the fourth dimension. You can inhale fourth dimensional prana directly through the tube. You could be in a vacuum, a total void, with no air to breathe and completely survive if you could live the principles of this understanding. As Richard Hoagland has shown the United Nations and NASA, we are now beginning to scientifically rediscover this field. Just as it is shown around Leonardo, it is also around planets, suns and even larger bodies. This could become the standard explanation of how some of these outer planets survive. Why? The planets are radiating off the surface far more energy than they are receiving from the sun a lot more. Where is it coming from? With this new understanding, if Leonardo were a planet instead of a person, the points at the north and south poles would be bringing in huge amounts of energy from another dimension, or dimensions. Planets literally exist in more than one dimension, and if you could see the whole earth in all its glory, the various fields and energies around a planet, you'd be astounded. Mother Earth is far more intricate and complex than we at this dense level can perceive. This channeling of energy is actually how it works for people, too. And the particular dimension, or dimensions, that this energy comes from depends on how we breathe. On Leonardo's drawing, the tetrahedron pointing up to the sun is male. The one pointing down toward the Earth is female. We're going to call the male one a sun tetrahedron and the female one an earth tetrahedron. There are only two symmetrical ways that a human being can look out of this star tetrahedral form with one point of the star above the head and one point below the feet and with the alignment of the human body looking toward the horizon, for a male body looking out of his form, his sun tetrahedron has a point facing forward, and the opposite flat face is behind him. His earth tetrahedron has a point facing out the back, and the opposite flat face is in front. For a female body looking at other form, her sun tetrahedron has a flat face forward, and a point facing out the back, and her earth tetrahedron has a point facing forward, and the opposite flat face is behind her. We'll explain the Merkaba meditation through the 14th breath in volume 2. First I would like to introduce other aspects so that you can begin to remember and prepare yourself for the eventual reactivation of your light body, the Merkaba. Beginning soon, we'll start talking about yogic breathing, which probably many of you are already familiar with. Then we'll learn about mudras after that. We're going to keep going step by step until we are ready to experience spherical breathing, the state of being from which your Merkaba can come to life. Thrinus in duality, the holy trinity. To understand the situation here on earth, we will offer another piece of information to refer to as we proceed. In nature, the law of opposites appears to be manifesting throughout our reality, such as male and female or hot and cold. In truth, this is incomplete. Actually, every manifestation in our reality has three components. You hear people talk about male and female polarity and about polarity consciousness, that isn't the full truth. There has never been a polarity in this reality without a third component, with one rare exception we will talk about in a moment. There is a trinity in almost every situation. Let's think of some examples of what we usually call polarity. How about black and white, hot and cold, up and down, male and female and sun and earth? For black and white, there's grey, for hot and cold, there's warm, for up and down, there's the middle, for male and female, there's a child, for the sun and the earth, male and female, there's the moon, child. Time is also in three components, past, present and future. The mental relationship of how we see space is with the x, y, z axes front and back, 
left and right, up and down. Even in each of these three directions there's a middle or neutral point, creating three parts. Probably the best example is the fabric of matter itself in this third dimension. Matter is made of three basic particles, protons, electrons and neutrons. On the next higher level of organization from the three basic particles you will find atoms, and on the next lower level, finer particle divisions. In a similar manner, consciousness perceives itself in the middle between the macrocosm and the microcosm. If you look closely into either level, you will always find thinness. There is a special exception, as there almost always is. It relates to the beginning of things. Primal aspects usually do have thinness, but they are extremely rare. An example is found in number sequences. Sequences such American Samoa 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, or 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. And in fact, all sequences known strangely enough need a minimum of three successive numbers of the sequence in order to calculate the entire sequence with one exception, the golden mean logarithmic spiral, which needs only two. This is because that spiral is the source of all other sequences. In the same manner, atoms all have three parts, as mentioned before, with the single exception of the first atom, hydrogen. Hydrogen has only one proton and one electron, it has no neutron. If it has a neutron, which is the next step up, it is called heavy hydrogen but the very beginning of matter has only two components. Since we mentioned numbers exhibiting thinness, we might as well bring up color. There are three primary colors from which the three secondary colors are created. This means that the universe as we now know it all created things, is composed of three primary parts except in its rare primal areas. In addition, the very nature of how the universe is perceived by human consciousness is through the three major ways we just spoke of, time, space and matter, all of which are reflections of the sacred holy trinity. An avalanche of knowledge. Most people by now are aware that something unusual is going on here on earth. We are in extremely accelerated time, and many events are happening that have never been seen before. There are more people on the planet than have ever been known before, and if we continue at the same rate, in a few more years we will double our population to about 11 or 12 billion people. Regarding our human evolutionary learning curve, the supply of information on the planet is growing far faster than the population. Here's a fact according to the Encyclopedia Britannica. From the time of our oldest known human civilization, the ancient Sumerians, circa 3800 BC, continuing for almost 5800 years until about AD 1900, a certain number of bits of information had been collected a certain number of so-called facts that were added up to determine precisely how many things we knew. Fifty years later, from 1900 to 19 to 50, our knowledge had doubled. That means it took 5,800 years to learn a certain amount, then it took 50 years to double it, amazing. But then in the next 20 years, by about 19 to 70, we doubled it again. It took only 10 more years, to about 19 to 80. To double that. Now it's doubling every few years. Knowledge is coming in like an avalanche. The information was coming so fast in the mid 80s that NASA couldn't put it into their computers fast enough. I heard that in approximately 1988 they were eight or nine years behind in simply entering the incoming data. At the same time, this avalanche of knowledge is building up, the computers themselves, which are boosting the acceleration are about to make a huge change. Approximately every 18 months computers are doubling both speed and memory. First we came out with the 286, then the 386, then we had the 486, and now the 586 is out, this was 1993, which makes the 486 obsolete. We didn't even know how to use the 486 yet, and here's the 586. And we've already got the 686 planned. By the turn of the century or soon afterward, a home computer will be so powerful and fast that it will surpass all of the present, 1993, 
computers of NASA and the Pentagon combined. A single computer will be so fast and powerful that it can actually watch the whole Earth and give constant weather data for every square inch of the planet. It will do things that now seem absolutely impossible. And we're beginning to speed up our ability to enter the data. Now huge amounts of information are entered directly from other computers and scanners and direct voice. So with this incredible amount of knowledge entering into human consciousness, it becomes obvious that a major change for humankind is being birthed. For thousands of years spiritual information was kept secret. Priests and priestesses of various religions or cults would give their lives to keep the rest of the world from knowing about one of their secret documents or piece of spiritual knowledge, making sure it remained secret. All the various spiritual groups and religions around the world had their secret information. Then suddenly, in the mid-sixties, the veil of secrecy was lifted. In unison, almost all the spiritual groups of the world opened their archives at the same moment in history. You can browse through books in your neighborhood bookstore and see information that has been sealed and guarded for thousands of years. Why? Why now? Life on this planet is accelerating faster and faster and faster, obviously culminating in something new and different, perhaps just out of the reach of our normal imagination. We are always changing. What does this mean for the world? Why is it happening? Better yet, why is it happening now? Why didn't it happen a thousand years ago? Or why didn't it wait to happen one hundred, one thousand or ten thousand years from now? It's really important to understand the answer to this question, because if you don't know why this is happening now, then you probably will not understand what's happening to you in your life or be prepared for the coming changes. Though I don't want to get into the real meaning of what this is about right now, one of the answers lies in the fact that the computer is made out of silicon and we're made out of carbon. It's tied into the relationship of silicon and carbon. But I'll leave that for a while and continue with the unusual nature of what's happening here on Earth. Earth's relation to the cosmos. Let's talk about Sirius and the Earth again. You are here, and this is where we begin in the big picture. From where we are on this third planet out from the Sun, Earth's intimate connection to Sirius cannot be understood very easily. You have to go out into deep space to things like this, which you might not recognize at least most people don't. This is a quasar, and it's enormous. It defies all the laws of physics, and we don't know what the heck it's doing. But that's not really what I want you to notice. Spirals in space. This next photo is a little closer and more familiar to us. This is a galaxy, obviously not us, because it's pretty hard to take a picture of yourself from within yourself. The cluster at the bottom right is a nebula, and it is almost certainly much, much closer than the galaxy, they are not connected. Notice the stars coming out of the galaxy in a white spiral. At exactly 180 degrees opposite one of the spirals is another emerging spiral. I believe there are eight known forms of galaxies, though all of them are functions of each other and this is the primary model. For a long time astronomers pretty much thought that what you saw out there was it, if you could see it, it was there. They were either totally oblivious to the invisible side of reality, or they didn't feel it was that important. But the invisible side of our reality is actually much greater than the visible side, and probably more important. In fact, if the full electromagnetic spectrum were a line about two yards long, then visible light, with which we see objects, would be a band about 1 over 32 of an inch wide. In other words, the visible part of the reality is far less than 1% of the total, almost nothing. The invisible universe is really our true home. There's much more. There are things even beyond the electromagnetic spectrum that we're just beginning to understand. For example, they've discovered that when an old sun explodes and dies, like the one in the bottom right of the picture, it seems to occur only in the dark area of the spiral, shown by arrow A, indicating that there is a difference between deep space, arrow B, and the inner space between the light spirals. 
so they're beginning to realize there's a distinct difference between the two areas of space as well as between the dark and the light areas of the galaxy. There's something different about the dark areas of the spiral that seems to be related to the light areas. Our serious connection. Observing these characteristics of a galactic spiral led to another discovery. Other scientists noticed that as our solar system moves through space, it's not moving in a straight line, but in a helical pattern, a spiral. Well, such a spiral is not possible unless we are gravitationally connected to another large body, such as another solar system or something larger. For example, many people think the moon rotates around the Earth, right? It does not. It never has. The Earth and the moon rotate around each other and there's a third component between them approximately one third of the distance from the earth to the moon, which is the pivotal point, and the earth and moon rotate around this point in a helical pattern as they also move around the sun day. This happens because the earth is connect with a very large body, which is the moon. Our moon is huge, and it's causing the earth to move in a particular pattern. And since the entire solar system is spiraling in the same manner through space, then the whole solar system must be gravitationally connected with some other very large body. So astronomers started searching for this body that was pulling on our solar system. They first narrowed it down to a certain area of the sky that we were linked with, then they narrowed it down further and further, until just a few years ago they finally pinned it down to a specific solar system. We are linked with the star Sirius, with Sirius A, and Sirius B. Our solar system and the Sirius system are intimately connected through gravitation we move through space together, spiraling around a common center. Our fate and the fate of Sirius are intimately connected. We are one system. Ever since scientists have known all about the dark area inside a spiraling galaxy being different, they have discovered that stars don't just move out along the curved arm of a spiral. If someone spun a water hose over high head and you viewed the scene from above, you would see droplets that appeared to move in spirals. Can you envision that? Each individual drop though, is not moving in a spiral, but is moving radially away in a straight line from the center, it only appears to be moving in spirals. It's the same way in a galaxy. Each of these stars is actually moving radially away. At the same time the stars are moving radially away from the center, they are also moving, independent of the system as a whole, from one arm through the dark light into the white light, orbiting the whole galactic system. It probably takes billions of years, I don't know, for one cycle to complete itself. Imagine that is a galaxy viewed from above and that the dark color represents the black light spirals and the light color represents the white light spirals. From the edge it looks like a flying saucer. The orbit we make around the center of the galaxy has within it a spiral motion similar to a coiled spring. In addition to our solar system, the same spiral motion is seen between Sirius A, and Sirius B. The spiral of the Earth and the Moon, I believe, is different. This spiraling motion of the two Syrian stars just happens to be identical to the geometries of the DNA molecule according to an Australian scientist. This makes you suspect that perhaps there's a relationship in the unfoldment of things, that events happen according to some kind of larger plan, similar to the unfoldment of a human body guided by the information within the DNA. Of course, it's only speculation, but because of the principle as above, so below, this is highly probable. So we have two related questions to answer. One is why Sirius is so important? which has been explained by our gravitational connection to it, an offer is, why is this extremely rapid pattern of evolution we are experiencing on earth today taking place at this moment in history? Let's keep looking in the heavens. First, here are two incidental pieces of information to share. A galaxy's spiral arms, surrounding sphere and heat envelope is out of National Geographic, showing what they've now discovered. They found that spheres of energy surround galaxies. Notice the tiny galaxy with its spiraling arms, along with a bunch of loose stars, all enveloped in the sphere of energy. Then outside that sphere is another enormous sphere of energy, shown here as a hexagonal grid. So there's a huge sphere inside a smaller sphere, with a tiny galaxy inside it. 
as we progress, you're going to see that you have exactly the same field around you. Figure 2 to 38 is a picture of the heat envelope of a galaxy, slightly tilted, sun, and as the Earth orbits the sun, the angle that the light hits the surface of the Earth changes, depending on where it is in its orbit. This is why we have four seasons. Within this yearly rotation there's another very slow wobble, which most people know as the precession of the equinoxes, which takes almost 26,000 years to complete. To be more accurate, it's about 25,920 years, it depends on who you read, because everybody comes up with a few years difference. There are other wobbles, too. For example, that plus 23 degree angle to the sun is not fixed, there's a wobble of about 40,000 years where it changes about 3 degrees, from about 23 to about 26 degrees. Then there's another wobble inside the little 3 degree wobble that completes a cycle about every 14 months. And they've discovered another one that completes about every 14 years. Now they say they've discovered yet another one. If you read the ancient Sanskrit writings, all these wobbles are profoundly important for consciousness on the planet. They're tied directly to specific events and to the time these events happen on the planet, just as our DNA is tied to the various phases in the growth of the human body. For now I just want to look at the main wobble, which is called the precession of the equinoxes. This wobble moves in an oval pattern, and the large oval in figure 2 to 40 is the wobble itself. The right end, on the long axis of the oval, is called the apogee, which points toward the center of the galaxy. The bottom half of the oval shows when the planet is heading toward the center of the galaxy, and the top half shows when the planet has come back around and is heading away from the center. This movement away from the center of the galaxy is also called going with the galactic wind. The Sanskrit writings say that the ancient beings who somehow knew about the precession, say that it's not at the far ends of this oval when great change takes place, but slightly after these extreme points are passed at the points indicated by the two small ovals at A, and C. Great change takes place at those two points. There are two other points sitting halfway between the small ovals, shown at B and D, which are also very important places, though change is not as likely as at A, and C. Right now in the 1990s we are positioned at A, the lower small oval, which indicates that this is a time of tremendous change. According to the ancient writings, when we reach the upper small oval at sea, moving away from the center of the galaxy, we begin to fall asleep and keep losing consciousness and falling through the dimensional levels until we come to the place at the lower small oval, when we start to wake up and begin to move up through the dimensional levels. We wake up in definite stages until we get to the upper oval again, when we fall asleep again. But this is not a closed pattern, because we're moving through space. It's a helical, open-ended pattern like a spring, not a repeating cycle as within a circle. Because of that, each time around we fall asleep a little less than the time before and wake up a little more. A similar cycle occurs on Earth each day. If you look at the Earth from space, it is half dark and half light at any moment, and the people on the dark side are pretty much asleep and the people on the light side are pretty much awake. Even though we have day and night, we don't repeat the same things over and over, but hopefully we wake up and become more conscious each day. Even though we fall asleep and wake up, we keep going further each time. This procession of the equinoxes is just the same, only it's a much longer cycle. Yugas. The Tibetans and the Hindus called these particular time periods yugas, which are simply ages. Each yuga has both a descending and ascending phase, so if you use the Hindu system, the age around the top oval at sea is called the descending Satya Yuga. Then comes the descending Treta Yuga, Dwapara Yuga, and Kali Yuga at the other end. In the Kali Yuga you have both descending and ascending. Then you enter the ascending Dwapara and so on. We're now in the ascending Dwapara Yuga. We're out of the Kali Yuga by about 900 years, and right now is the time when amazing things are predicted to happen. The world is now rediscovering for itself that these are periods of enormous changes on Earth. This diagram was made by Sri Yukteswar, Yogananda's guru. He did this in the late 1800s. 
though he did not know the true time duration of the procession of the equinoxes, he put it at 24,000 years. That was very close, because most Hindus had no idea of what they were doing when working with the Yugas. I don't mean to put them down, but they didn't. You see, when we were coming through the Kali Yuga, we were in the darkest most asleep times. Most of the books written in the last 2000 years were written by people who were asleep, relatively speaking, and were trying to interpret books written by people who were much more awake. They didn't understand what the older books were saying. So, as with any book written in the last 2000 years, you've got to be a little bit careful because of the time it was written in. Many Hindu scholars were putting the procession of the equinoxes at hundreds of thousands of years, and some said one yuga is around 150,000 years. They were wrong and just did not understand. Yukteswar knew better, but he wasn't quite right either. What he did in this diagram was to put the different yugas around the outer edge, and on the inside he put the twelve signs of the zodiac, thus showing which yugas corresponded with what sign. When he made this chart we were in Virgo, shown in the bottom left quadrant. At the moment we're between Virgo and Leo. Depending on what astrologer you talk to, we're close to the third eye of the Virgin right now and passing into Leo, that's physically. That means the planet physically is between Virgo and Leo. But if you look 180 degrees across the heavens, you see the sky moving from Pisces into Aquarius. At this moment we are right on the line between Pisces and Aquarius, about to head into the age of Aquarius. But physically it's a whole different point of view. You need to understand that, because when we look at the works in Egypt, some of their writings don't make sense without knowing this perspective. Modern views on pole shifts. In the 1930s, Edgar Cayce was channeling answers for a geologist when, in the middle of a question, KC stopped and said something like, you know, there's something a little more important going on with the earth that maybe you should know about, and started talking about how the poles of the earth are going to shift soon. He said the year it would happen would be the winter of 1998, but things have changed since then in a psychically unpredictable manner. The poles still may shift, but then again, they may do it in a way slightly different from KC's prediction. We do have free will and we can change the fate of the world simply through our being. Edgar Cayce was an extraordinary human. He was a man people listened to when he spoke. The statement by Cayce that the poles were going to shift in the near future was almost unbelievable by most of the world. But because it was Edgar Cayce predicting this outrageous event, scientists and other interested persons began to study the possibility. Geologists would not believe his statement because they thought it would probably be millions or hundreds of millions of years between pole shifts, that this kind of change took a very long time. But because of Casey's prediction, certain scientists began to search anyway. A string of major pieces of evidence came forth that lent tremendous weight to what Casey was saying, and they have now changed the world's view on this subject. The scientists suspected that if there were a change in the physical poles, then there would also be a change in the magnetic poles. One of the ways they decided to study this possibility was to examine the ancient lava beds of the world. This started taking place, I believe, in the 1950s or early 60s. They wanted to study lava beds because, one, they figured there would be tremendous volcanic action if such a shift took place, and, two, Lava has a characteristic that could verify and date previous magnetic pole shifts. Iron bilings and core samples. Iron bilings are found in most lava, and these bilings have a different melting point than the lava itself. The bilings harden while the lava is still flowing and, being iron, line up with the magnetic poles. Through this observation, geologists can see exactly where the magnetic poles were at the time the lava hardened. They needed to get samples from only three locations to be able to triangulate and know exactly where the magnetic north pole was at the time the pilings hardened. Then, of course, they could radiocarbon date it, which was the best they could do back in those days. There were other approaches to this problem, which we will look at in a moment. So they discovered an earlier magnetic north pole that was not where it is now but a long way away, 
centered in Hawaii. That last shift took place right at the Uproval, a little less than 13,000 years ago. They then did another test and found that the poles had shifted before that at the lower oval. This opened up a whole new area of investigation into the Earth's magnetics. The Geological Society of America published a summary of findings gathered from ocean floor core samples, Geology 11, 9, September 19283. The samples were 6 inches in diameter and 11 feet long, and the researchers analyzed the sediment. They discovered that sometimes the poles simply reverse themselves. The north becomes the south and the south becomes the north. This was another thing Edgar Cayce talked about that people had a hard time believing. But when they analyzed these core samples, they found it was true. Going back hundreds of millions of years, they discovered a cycle where the magnetic north pole would remain in place for a long time, then in a single day, less than 24 hours magnetic north switched to the south. It stayed that way for a long time, then switched again. But toward the ends of these long cycles were shorter periods where the magnetic poles would reverse themselves again. This flip happened every once in a while. And as we come closer into present times, the flips are starting to happen closer together, from north to south, south to north, and at the same time moving to new locations. This has happened hundreds of times over the last several hundred million years. A whole new viewpoint of the Earth's magnetics, called geomagnetics, is beginning to be understood. From space, would this not appear as a pulse? Pole shift triggers? By now there have been many people trying to figure out what could cause a pole shift. What are the dynamics? What's the trigger that makes it happen? There's a book by John White who's also an Edgar Cayce advocate, who has compiled almost all the information in the world on this subject, though he does not mention, I believe, the particular information on the last magnetic shift being in Hawaii. His book is called Pole Shift, of course. It's a very scientific and interesting book. If you read it, you'll get an excellent understanding of this subject, which is vast and amazing. There are two main theories right now about what the trigger could be that would cause the poles to move. One of them is obvious and the other more subtle. The obvious one is called the Brown theory, named after Hugh Watchin Kloss Brown, who conceived this idea. His theory is that for some reason the South Pole begins to form off center, which is exactly what's happening now, then it builds up quite rapidly toward the end of the cycle, which is also exactly what's happening now until one day it breaks free from the centrifugal force of the Earth's rotation. It's just like any spinning object, when something is off-center, it throws the whole object off-center and forces it to find a new equilibrium. If the weight of the ice keeps building and building, eventually something's going to happen. The Earth can't keep spinning in the same rotational position. It will find a new pole that is centered. Yet there are some scientists who believe that the mass of ice at the South Pole is not enough to trigger a pole shift. As a matter of fact, the ice at the South Pole in some places is over three miles deep and building, especially rapidly over the last 20 years, faster than ever expected, probably because of the greenhouse effect. And today there are three enormous volcanoes underneath the ice cap that can be seen from our satellites. It's melting the underside of the ice cap and huge rivers are flowing out from beneath it at this very moment. Perhaps this fact was not entered into the equation by the doubting scientists. If that ice cap, which is twice the size of the United States, were to break free, it's been calculated that it would move toward the equator at 1,700 miles an hour to find balance, according to John White. That would obviously cause some problems here and there. Brown's theory appears to be happening but it is not a certainty. However, someone has offered another theory, one which even Albert Einstein considered seriously, that holds a possible answer to the equations that unbelieving scientists have used. His name is Charles Hapgood. He, and other scientists who worked with him, discovered at least two layers of unusual rock underneath the Earth's crust which liquefy under certain conditions. Other scientists have demonstrated this in laboratories where they've put the same kind of rock into a miniature earth, and duplicated the conditions of the inner earth. 
From this experiment, they found that the surface or crust of the earth can slip over the main mass of the earth, which continues its rotation as if nothing had happened. It's a fact. It can happen, but of course we do not know if it will actually happen in real time. They don't know the specifics of how this would work, such as what trigger could cause this slippage. Charles Hapgood wrote two books, Earth's Shifting Crust and the Path of the Pole, that will probably eventually change our view of our world dramatically. Albert Einstein wrote the foreword to Charles Hapgood's first book, Earth's Shifting Crust. I feel it is important enough to reprint here directly. I frequently receive communications from people who wish to consult me concerning their unpublished ideas. It goes without saying that these ideas are very seldom possessed of scientific validity. The very first communication, however, that I received from Mr. Hapgood electrified me. His idea is original, of great simplicity, and, if it continues to prove itself, of great importance to everything that is related to the history of the Earth's surface. The author has not confined himself to a simple presentation of this idea. He has also set forth, cautiously and comprehensively, the extraordinarily rich material that supports his displacement theory. I think that this rather astonishing, even fascinating, idea deserves the serious attention of anyone who concerns himself with the theory of the Earth's development. It is a given that Albert Einstein was one of the most brilliant humans who has ever lived, yet few geologists even yet believe such an outrageous theory. Only in more recent times has proof begun to accumulate that such things could be true. The same scientific world didn't believe Mr. Einstein either when he said how much energy was contained within a very small amount of matter. It is my belief that the trigger to the pole shift is connected with the geomagnetism of the Earth. This would take a long time to explain, which I am not prepared to do here at this time. What is known is that for the last 500 years the Earth's magnetic field has been continually weakening, and in the last few years it has been doing absolutely bizarre things. According to Greg Braden in Awakening 2.0, the collective initiation, the Earth's magnetic field actually began to weaken about 2000 years ago. Then around 500 years ago, the weakening really began to accelerate. Could it be 520 years? This would match the Mayan calendar, which predicted a huge change at that time. In recent times the magnetic field is making unheard of changes. Magnetic flow changes. The idealized lines of magnetic flow you see coming out in a torus around the earth are not what geologists have found. The reality is that the magnetic lines look rather like straight weaving patterns. They're fixed, but they're not precise in that idealized kind of way. And there are certain areas where they're stronger and other areas where they're weaker. These lines normally do not move, but because the field is getting so weak, they are beginning to move and change. The birds, animals and fish, and the dolphins and whales and other creatures use these magnetic lines for their migration patterns. So if the magnetic lines change, their migration patterns go off, which is what we're seeing all over the world right now. Birds are flying to places they're not supposed to be, and whales are beaching themselves on land, where it's supposed to be water as far as they're concerned. They're simply following the magnetic line they've followed for centuries, and they're running into land that wasn't on that line before. When these magnetic fields pass through zero point and completely change, which they may do very soon, we'll have another subject to talk about, about what happens then. You see, we believe your very memory is tied to those fields. You can't remember anything without these magnetic fields. In addition, your emotional body is tied powerfully to the magnetic fields, and if they change, your emotional body is radically affected. It's easy to understand that the moon affects the tides of the world through the pull of gravity. We also know that the magnetic fields of the earth are slightly affected by the phases of the moon. When the moon is full and passes overhead, we get a slight bulge and change in the magnetic field of the earth. Just look at what happens in big cities during a full moon. The day before, the day off, and the day after the full moon, we have more rapes and murders and killings and weirdness of this nature than we do for the rest of the entire month. The police blotter of any major city will verify that. 
Why? Because these fields especially affect people who are right on the edge of emotional instability, who are barely able to cope during normal times. They're right on the edge, then the moon comes along and moves the magnetic field just a little bit, and the person experiences an emotional dip and does things he or she normally wouldn't do. So imagine what would happen if the geomagnetic field of the Earth starts destabilizing. I heard in October 1993 from someone who's involved in aviation that in the last two weeks of September, major landing strips had to recalibrate their guidance systems because the magnetic fields made a unilateral shift all over the planet. It seemed to be temporary, lasting about two weeks. At that time you might have remembered an incredible emotional outburst within yourself and people around you. In my world I am on the phone with people from all over the world. People were freaking out everywhere. That's why I suspected that maybe what I heard might really be true. If it is true, then we are beginning to proceed almost certainly into the next phase of this work. These breakdowns in the magnetic field of the earth will begin to come closer and closer together until there is a total collapse of the field and a shifting of the poles. This is one of the signs of the very end times. There's no reason to get into fear about any of this. Even though what's happening is unusual, we've all been through these kinds of things many, many times before. This is not unusual for you, though most of you have very little memory of it. When you actually start going through the dimensional shift and get into the feel of it, you'll say, oh, yeah, I remember this now. Here we are, going through this birthing again. So it's not a big deal, yet it is. You came from somewhere else when you were born as a baby, right? You came from some other dimension and you passed through a void and came out through the womb to earth. You traveled this path before, and we're about to do a similar kind of thing, only it's a really unusual one this time. There's no reason to fear it when you know all of it and remember who you are. In fact, what's occurring is extremely positive. It's very, very beautiful. Harmonic and disharmonic levels of consciousness. The Sanskrit literature talks about how when we approach the lower ovalata in the procession, we become aware of electrical energies. We can fly in the sky. We can do many unusual things. The world becomes extremely unstable, and in a single day we get rid of the old way of viewing the world and make a huge transformation in consciousness. But as we approach this transformation, given the particular level of consciousness we have, we tend to destroy everything we touch. It's a natural part of who we are. We're not doing anything wrong, it's just the way we are. We're doing it exactly right. We destroy everything, we cause everything to go into disharmony. I'll be talking about this later, but I think it would be appropriate to tell you this much now, on earth, according to Thoth. There are five totally different steps or levels of life that each human is going to pass through. When we reach the fifth level, we will make a transformation that transcends known life itself. That's the normal pattern. Each one of these levels of consciousness has many aspects that are different from the other levels. First, they have different chromosome levels. The first level of human consciousness has 42 plus 2 chromosomes. The second level has 44 plus 2 chromosomes, the third one has 46 plus 2, the fourth, 48 plus 2, and finally 50 plus 2. Each level of human consciousness has a different body height associated with it. This might sound kind of funny if you've never heard it before. The first level of 42 plus 2 has a range of height somewhere between 4 and maybe 6 feet. The people who fall into that category specifically are the Aborigines in Australia, and I believe that certain tribes in Africa and South America also do. The second level of consciousness has 44 plus 2 chromosomes, and that's us. Our band of height is about 5 to 7 feet. We're a little taller than the first group. The third level's height goes up considerably. The 46 plus 2 chromosome level interrupts the reality through what you could term unity or Christ consciousness. That range of height is from about 10 to 16 feet tall. Then there's another range for the fourth level of consciousness, the 48 plus 2s, who have a height of about 30 to 35 feet. The final band, the perfected human, is between 50 and 60 feet tall. 
they have 52 chromosomes. I suspect that the reason there are 52 cards in a deck is related to those 52 chromosomes of the potential of man. For those of you who are Hebrew, you might remember that Metatron, the perfect man, that which we will become, was blue and 55 feet tall. We'll talk about this again when we get into the subject of Egypt, there are states between the consciousness levels, like Down syndrome, for example. Down syndrome happens when a person transitions from this second level of consciousness, which we are on, into the third level, but didn't quite make it. The person didn't get all the instructions right, and where he almost always fails is in the left brain instructional aspect of the chromosomes. A Down syndrome person has 45 plus 2 chromosomes, he got one of them, but not the other. He or she got the emotional one, the heart one, all right. If you know any Down syndrome children, they are pure love, but they don't understand how to make the transition into the third level of human consciousness. They are still learning. The second and fourth levels of consciousness are disharmonic, and the first, third and fifth levels are harmonic. You'll understand this when we see it in the geometries. When you look at human consciousness from a geometrical point of view, you can see the harmonic levels, and you can see that the disharmonic levels are simply out of balance. That's where we are right now, out of balance. These disharmonic levels are absolutely necessary. You can't get from level 1 to level 3 without passing through level 2. But 2 is a totally disharmonic consciousness. Does not chaos bring change? Whenever a consciousness gets into the second or fourth level, it knows it can be there for only a short time. These levels are used as stepping stones, like a stone in the middle of a river, one you jump on and get off of as soon as you can to get to the other side. You don't hang out there, because if you do, you fall in. If we were to hang out here on earth even just a little bit longer, we would destroy our planet. We would destroy it by just being who we are. Yet we are a sacred and necessary step in evolution. We are a bridge to another world. And we are living this bridge by just being alive in this incredible time.